Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Gangs in the early 20th century turned Britain's racetracks into battlegrounds. A Birmingham gang called the Brummagems were the top dogs and built up a criminal network reaching far beyond their city. The Brummagems made fortunes from racetrack extortion and beat their rivals mercilessly to protect their territory. Over 80 years later in 2003, another Birmingham gang kills innocent bystanders and shocks the nation. But behind the guise of a random shooting lies a complicated vendetta between two gangs, where rivalry, ego, loyalty to the gang outweighs even the love of their own family. We're going to be looking at the gangs of Britain's second city, Birmingham, old and new, and see how gang crime has evolved and the steps taken to tackle it. We'll be following the stories of two landmark gang attacks and two courageous individuals who put their lives on the line to bring the culprits to justice. In the 19th century, Birmingham was known as the city of a thousand trades. Unlike Manchester, based solely around cotton goods, Birmingham had a wide variety of specialised skills, producing anything metal, from buttons and buckles to jewellery, steam engines and guns. Like most cities in the UK, Birmingham's gangs were territorial, often being named after the areas they came from. I'm walking in what was once the Gun Quarter. In the 19th century, that was the name of a gang from here. Others were called the White House Gang from Aston, the Garrison's Lane, Ten Archers, Bishop Riders, and then there were the Peaky Blinders. During the 19th century, the population of Birmingham swelled from 74,000 to over 630,000. There was overcrowding, back-to-back -back housing, filth and poverty. Gang fights were commonplace. But then Birmingham underwent vast redevelopment. People moved out of the congested centre to newly built estates in the suburbs. Early in the 20th century, one of the Birmingham gangs known as the Brummagem Hammers began to spread from the streets of Birmingham to around the country. And this was all because of one lucrative business, horse racing. The English have always had a passion for the sport. Only the wealthy could afford to buy racehorses, to breed them and to race them. But anyone could afford to bet on them. After the First World War, racecourses were the only legal gambling places, with an annual turnover approaching 500 million pounds. They became the playgrounds of choice for a liberated generation. But the bulging satchels of the bookmakers attracted criminal gangs wanting a piece of the action, and the Brummagems wanted the biggest slice. I've come to meet a former member of the Mets flying squad, police historian Dick Kirby. Dick. Gary, delighted to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. So I suppose the first question is, you know, what did the Brummagems uh, see in racecourses? What, what, why were they here? Well, they saw an awful lot of money. 
in those days, before the First World War, practically anybody could set up as a bookmaker. Oh, right. There were no real rules and regulations, and uh, the bookmakers just paid out if they could afford it. Uh, and if they didn't, they hired bodyguards to protect them from enraged punters who wanted their winnings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Race courses were prey to gangsters, fraudsters, pre-card tricksters, but there was also pure hooliganism. Local historian Carl Chin has made a study of the racetrack gangs. Blokes would go up to somebody and say, hey, to a bookie, you're the bookie. Oh, give us ten bob for poor old Fred, he's just come out of Nick. Right. Poor old Fred hadn't come out of Nick. Didn't poor, old, poor old Alf's just going into Nick, give us ten bob. I see. Or else even cruder. If you don't give me a pound, I'm going to turn you upside down. Right, right. So a lot of bookmakers hired minders, tough foxes. It was might rules. I see. And so whether you were bookmakers or punters, if gangs came along and preyed upon you, you were struggling. And the gang that posed the greatest danger and controlled the most race courses was the Brummagems. According to a 1922 police report, the Brummagems were mostly made up of convicted thieves of the worst type. These men, they're not your run-of-the-mill fighter who comes out the pub perhaps on a Saturday night, he's had a few too many, and him and his, his bloke down the road have had a fallout and they have a set to. They were really violent, nasty men who enjoyed violence. The gang charged bookmakers as much as 50% of their profits for the privilege of being left unmolested. In turn, some of the bookies began to use the gang's services to dissuade winning punters from pressing their claims for payment. Like many of these early gangs, the group centered around one strong individual. And for the Brummagem Hammers, that man was Billy Kimber, and he carried a fearsome reputation. Billy Kimber was born in 1892 in Aston, the son of a brass founder. Handsome, well-built and charismatic, he became the teenage member of the Peaky Blinders, known for their sharp dress. Kimber soon graduated to the Brummagems, the largest gang throughout the 1920s and 30s. He was a lion of a man. He was fearless. He said, but he wouldn't fight with knives. He'd only fight with his fists. Right. So he had, he was a violent man, I'm not excusing that, but he had, must have had charisma to control all this lads. When he was 18, he had a conviction for assault and served time in Birmingham's Winston Green Prison. It was here that Kimber met fellow gangman George Brummy Sage, who introduced Kimber to the idea of racetrack extortion. This union would transform the fortunes of Billy Kimber and the Brummagems, turning the gang from a group of ruffians into an organised money-making enterprise. George Brummy Sage was one of his principal lieutenants, and between them had formed alliances with the Leeds mob and the Utoxital boys. So they became very, very strong, and what's more, um, Kimber became very wealthy. The expanding railway network enabled Kimber's Brummagems to travel to race meetings across the country. Doncaster in York, Utoxeter, down to Newbury and across to Newmarket. What they did, they brought in an organised protection racket instead of the kind of ad hoc arrangements that have been there before, yeah. when gangs have just come in willy-nilly, helter-skelter and scare people. Yeah. So I think for some of the bookmakers, the control of Billy Kimber was welcome because they knew what they were getting. And they would keep the other guys and the other yeah. guys away. So they'd keep the others away. And what it would be, Billy Kimber then would say the five best pitches at Ascot or Epsom, he would be in with a bookie on 10 bob in the pound. So for every 50 quid the bookies made, Billy Kimber got 25 quid. Then he and his men would control all the other rackets. So they would also like have the buckets of water. So after each race, when the bookies got the sponge to clear the writing in chalk on their boards, they would have to pay half a crown for the bucket of water, half a crown for the sponge, half a crown for the chalk. So you add it up, there might be a bookie who is paying perhaps for each race, 10 bob a race, six, seven, eight races, between three and four pound a day. If there's 30 or 40 bookies at a course, it's a good few bob coming in. But despite these huge profits, 
the Brahmagems set their sights on even more. Now their goal was to expand their territory and take over the most lucrative racecourses of all, the ones in the south. Gang crime in Birmingham has changed since the 1920s and 30s. Instead of running a money-making enterprise across the country, like the Brummagens, now gangs battle over respect and territory. One of the oldest and bloodiest feuds in recent years has been between two black gangs. The Johnson Crew, named after a cafe in Johnson Street, and the Burger Bar Boys. Its juvenile name taken from the fast food outlets in the Lazelles district, Master Gangs Menace. Its members carried out some of the most savage incidents of gang violence in the city. These are the areas they command. The A34 is like the unofficial boundary, the front line between the two gangs. The Johnson crew tend to be based in the northeast around Aston. The Burger Bar boys to the west, Lazelles, Winston Green, Handsworth. And the Burger Bar was right here. I've come to meet crime reporter Armadeep Bassi, a journalist who has reported on Birmingham's gangs for many years. Just behind us is where the Burger Bar used to be, from which the Burger Bar gang took their name. Right, so it's been redeveloped? Yeah, it's all become offices and, and apartments and stuff now, but for a long time it was known as the Burger Bar. Just uh, tell me a bit about why gangs started in Birmingham. Well, originally the, the gangs, certainly the black and Asian gangs, uh, started off as, you could say, almost vigilante gangs. There was a, a big problem with skinheads and the right wing in certain parts of Birmingham, and these gangs formed essentially to look after their own communities. But in 1981, tensions exploded in vicious race riots. Heavy-handed policing only inflamed the aggression on the streets as groups of young black youths began to take the law into their own hands. It kind of empowered a lot of the young black kids and that they thought, well, hang on, we've rioted. We managed to put the police on the back foot. You know, we, we can show some force when we want to. Eventually, as the right-wing threat dissipated, they kept that organisation together and it became more of a criminal network. Yeah. As, as drugs started coming into the community, they used those bonds and those links they had um, and directed towards criminal efforts instead. Right, so they were making money out of drugs. That's right, yeah. But along with drugs comes profit and territory, becoming a wedge which split the black gang into two, the Johnson crew and the Burger Bar boys. When drugs came, it became a case of, well, you know, who can make the money, make the most money, and that's, that's what caused the main split. People who were friends originally became sworn enemies. As crack cocaine swept through the city's poorest neighbourhoods, money poured into the gangs. The rivalry escalated, and so did the violence. In 2002, a series of tit-for-tat shootings between the Johnsons and the Burger Bar boys began when Johan Martin was shot in the middle of West Bromwich High Street in broad daylight. 24-year-old Johan Martin was a leading member of the Burger Bar crew. He happened to be spotted by uh, two female members of a gang which is affiliated to the Johnson crew. Now, they not only let members of the Johnson Crew gang know that Johan Martin was there, they also said that he was trying it on with them, in effect. Right. Um, and within about 15 minutes of the phone call being made to Johan Martin's killers, they were there on the scene, in a car, the car parked up next to Johan's car, then shot at Johan while he, was, while he was sat in his parked car on the high street. But this is unusual, isn't it, for girls to go that far, to be part of the gang and become the uh, perpetrator. That was uh, a first in a lot of ways. For them to actually take part actively in a murder was a new thing. People you know, hadn't seen that before. But there would be more. And now that girls were gang members, they too could become targets for rival gangs. On the night of January the 2nd, 2003, events would spiral out of control in one of the most callous slayings the city had ever seen. 
In the 1920s and 30s, the most powerful gang from Birmingham were called the Brummagems. They were led by a charismatic gangster called Billy Kimber. The Brummagems took control over many of the country's lucrative racetracks. They traveled to race meetings across the country, coming south to the big events with the most money, to Ascot and Epsom. This is what they would have looked like at the time. This photograph was taken in 1919. Sharp suits, buttonholes, boaters. But in contrast to their elegance, these are the sort of weapons they would have used. Hammers and blades, flick knives, cutthroats, bottles. And if all else fails, a revolver. A pretty formidable arsenal, but keeping control of the race circuits far away from home turf was always going to be tricky. In the south, the Brummagems faced tough competition from a major Italian crime family called the Sabinis. The racetracks in the south were run by the Italian mob, and the Italian mob uh, was run by Charles Darby Sabini, who had got four brothers, George, Joe, Fred, and Harry Boy, and they were all... Chris and Harry Boy, was he? He was Chris and Harry Boy, yeah. Uh, and they were uh, all a very tasty bunch. Uh, Darby Sabini had boxed as a middleweight, uh, and he always had a fully loaded automatic in his back pocket. The Brummagem boys came up against the Sabinis many times. This rare photograph shows both gangs posing for camera. Later, they became locked in tit-for-tat scraps until the violence reached a peak when Darby Sabini shot at Billy Kimber. Kimber decided to call a truce. He went to meet Sabini. But one of Sabini's men, a particularly violent man called Alfie Solomon, shot Kimber. Billy Kimber was found outside Sabini's flat with a bullet in his side. And uh, Alfie Solomons uh, later stood trial for his attempted murder, but was acquitted uh, after everybody lost their memory. <laughs> in, in, including Kimber? Including Kimber, who refused to give evidence because anyway. It was the code, I guess. And yes. I guess he didn't want the police involved with anything, did no, he? No, no. Then, just weeks later, at the Derby meeting in Epsom, the Sabinis attacked an associate of Kimber's with a mallet and bottle. For Kimber and the Brummagem boys, this was a step too far. Their retaliation would be brutal. On the first day of the Epsom Derby in 1921, the Birmingham boys decided to ambush the Sabinis. They left the race meeting early in a sharabang and hid in wait for them at Ewell, a few miles from Epsom. And this is where the attack took place. All right, so this is the London Road. Yes. And our mob would have parked up here because they would have, anyone coming from Epsom would have had to go back that way to London. Correct. Right. What happened was a car was parked in this turning here, yeah. anticipating the arrival of the Italian mob. And as soon as the car shot out to block the way, the Birmingham boys jumped out and went to work. That attack was incredibly vicious, wasn't it? It was a, a scene of carnage. The people in the houses round here were apparently screaming with terror uh, because the Birmingham boys were equipped with guns, with hatchets, house bricks, iron bars, knives, and they really went to work. The whole of the road here was littered with bodies. There was no one who was left standing. One of them had three fingers cut off on the gang that they thought were their adversaries, the Italian mob. But then they discovered, all too late, that it wasn't the Italian mob at all. It was their own associates from the north, the Leeds gang. One of the Leeds men heard somebody running behind him, um, and this was one of the Birmingham boys holding a hammer, and he looked to see if the Birmingham uh, boy was gaining on him and suddenly realised that he was one of their allies. And he said to, to this chap, you made a bloomer, we're from Leeds. And stra strangely enough, the Birmingham boy replied, my God, I hope not. Uh, 
Anyway, if you are, get into the bushes because there's no holding this lot and there'll be murder done today. And it was just by a, a gracious dispensation of providence that there wasn't. After their disastrous ambush, the Brummagems made off in a bright blue char -bank. Not the most inconspicuous of vehicles if you've got the police after you. And it wasn't long before Police Sergeant Joseph Dawson spotted it parked up outside here, which was then a pub known as the Georgian Dragon. Why the gang of 28, after committing such a terrible crime and knowing that the police were after them, decided to come in and have a drink here, I have no idea. I can only assume they were thirsty. The attack at Ewell had been so violent and bloody that the police first thought it had been a Sinn Féin operation and issued firearms to their officers. So, following the attack, it was here to the Georgian Dragon that the Birmingham boys came, and it was in this garden that they sat down to uh, refresh themselves after their exertions. Celebrating. Absolutely. And it was Sergeant Dawson who came walking in here and uh, upon having heard that they had come from Birmingham and uh, seeing the state of their clothing, which was absolutely splattered with blood, Sergeant Dawson uh, courteously uh, asked the, uh, the members of the Birmingham boys to consider themselves under arrest. <laughs> what did they think? They, they rose as one, all 28 of them, and uh, the plucky Sergeant Dawson drew out his revolver and said, I shall shoot the first man who tries to escape. Right. And immediately they, uh, they calmed down. So how long did Dawson hold them before he had reinforcements? Uh, I should think it was quite quick, but it must have s uh, seemed like an eternity to okay. him. Dawson was able to hold them at gunpoint until the flying squad arrived and arrested them. Nowadays, competition between the gangs in Birmingham forces them to stick to their own turf, which they defend tooth and nail, along with a juvenile notion of respect. After the murder of burger bar boy Johan Martin, his brother Nathan, street name 23, began planning his revenge against the Johnson crew. He found a willing recruit in Marcus Ellis, known as E-Man. Martin also recruited Michael Gregory, another gang member known as Chunk. Chunk had the task of coordinating the hit. He bought a pay-as-you-go mobile and purchased a getaway car, a red Ford Mondeo from a dealer in Northampton. In the afternoon of New Year's Eve 2002, the car was brought back to Birmingham. A window tinter was hired to darken the car's glass. All the gang needed now was an opportunity, and it arrived in the early hours of the 2nd of January 2003. One of the burger bar boys, Sonny Sims, was at a party at the Uni 7 hair salon in Aston, now a hardware store. Sims spotted several of the Johnson crew at the party. He relayed constant updates on his mobile to Gregory and the burger bar boys in the Mondeo, who now made their way towards the salon. The woman who ran the hair salon had had this New Year's Day party for the last few years. It was well known, so they tagged along. You know. And the party, by all accounts, was uh, you know, a normal affair. There was nothing unusual about it until the early hours of the morning when people reported that the atmosphere started getting very dark. There was rumors around that there's going to be trouble, something's going to happen. The car pulled into position, not far from the party. Inside was Marcus Ellis in the front passenger seat with a 9mm pistol. Behind him, Nathan Martin had a Mac-10 machine gun. Michael Gregory put the car into gear and set off. Sims guided the attackers into position. It was about four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. The place was winding up. Uh, people were piling out the back and uh, basically just getting some fresh air. 
So the party spills out onto the street. The Red Mondeo comes around the back here and stops just over there by this salon. Nathan Martin pulls out a Mac-10 and opens fire. Within a split second, 23 empty cartridges are spewed out from the machine gun. Charlene Ellis was the first to die, hit three times. Letitia Shakespeare, four times. Charlene's twin sister, Sophie, their cousin, Cheryl Shaw, and friend, Leon Harris, were all injured. You know what hits me here, right? He must have been, at, what, yeah. four foot away? That's right. Yeah. When he opened up with, he, the, with the Mac? He was so close that witnesses actually could point, you know, in court, they actually said the shape of the gun. They saw his finger on the trigger, it was that close. You know, they could make so out... You can see it, there's not much space here. You know, the car comes through here, yeah. the girls must have stood there. There would have been people, you know, milling around here. There would have been, you know, only a little bit of space for that car to come through. Uh, and on both sides, there would have been people. And it was literally a case of stick, sticking the gun out the window and pressing the trigger. They put their foot down and straight out that way, which then gets them onto the sort of main routes in and out of Birmingham. And then you're onto the, the motorway junction. So, you know, they seem to have made a clean getaway. I mean, as far as, as far as they were concerned, you know, yeah. it was a, a job done, yeah. Yeah. The police traced the car within two hours. They found it four miles away, burnt out. Much of the DNA and forensic evidence destroyed. But at the scene of the crime, the police found 37 cartridge cases, fired from three weapons, the Mac-10, a Spanish Llama pistol, and another weapon never recovered. What at first appeared to be an indiscriminate slaughter would unfold into one of the largest criminal investigations that the West Midlands police force had ever undertaken. The bodies of two young girls lay motionless on the ground. Innocent targets gunned down in the never-ending tit-for-tat war between Birmingham's two major gangs. The Burger Bar boys toasted the success of their attack with champagne. To them, it had been a huge success, as it had been carried out on their rival gang's turf. The callous and casual nature of their drive-by shooting, killing Letitia Shakespeare and Charlene Ellis, horrified Birmingham and shocked the nation. I went to see Letitia's mother, Marcia, who had to go and identify her daughter only hours after the shooting. As soon as I went into the room, I could see um, Letitia, she had a hairpiece on that day. Mm. And I could see that was like slinched to one side. I thought, well, this is Letitia. So I came round um, to have a look and she was there on the bed, but her eyes were wide open. Really? I've never seen her eyes that wide open. Yeah. Um, and I still couldn't absorb that she was dead. I still thought she was alive. I said, yeah. no, she's alive, her eyes are open, she's gotta be alive. And when I was walking around and looking, and when I looked, because her eyes were so open, you could see like where like the blood shot, like yeah. the shock. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Initially, just just yeah. killed her. She didn't have time to even close her eyes. Um, that aura stopped with me for about four weeks. I kept having nightmares, um, panic attacks. Um, just couldn't. Thought, nah, that hasn't happened. I yeah. didn't really think it happened. You can't believe it. You just can't take it in when no. something like that happens, can you? No. I couldn't. It appeared that the two girls had become accidental victims because the gun used in the attack was notoriously inaccurate. Very rare to have been found on the street. It's a, you know, a military issue yeah. machine gun. Fires off more than a, you know, 200 rounds a minute. Um, it, it's known on the streets actually as the spray and pray because it's so hard to control. I mean, even proper marksmen find it difficult to control a Mac-10. So to imagine that in the hands of uh, you know, a young kid who's probably never fired a gun before, it would have been all over the place. 
Although the murders of Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare had all the appearance of an indiscriminate shooting, the girls were not shot entirely by accident. So they came down here expecting to shoot whoever belonged to the Johnson crew. Exactly, yeah. So were the girls part of that crew? They weren't part of the crew, but it, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult for anybody who lives in a particular area not to associate with gang members. Um, you know, gang members may be people that you went to school with, people that you grew up with, people that you know you may even like. Doesn't, it say, you know, doesn't mean you're a part of that gang or condone what they do. Yeah. I know as I was growing up, it was if you walked with a prostitute, you were classed as a prostitute. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you walked with someone who was stealing, yeah. you was classed as a steal. So it's about knowing that if you're going to walk around with that type of person, you can have that same label. They probably didn't care if they did shoot women in that Johan Martin's murder involved women. Essentially, right, he was set right. up by women. Yeah. And that even subconsciously kind of changed the rules. It made women fair game. That night, a fundamental shift had taken place in the Birmingham underworld. Women had become legitimate targets in the turf war between the two main gangs. Even though Letitia Shakespeare and Charlene Ellis were innocent, just to be associated with a gang was enough to make them a target. The submachine gun the killers used in the attack, they now called a unisex weapon. Young women seem to be key roles in violent crime. A lot of them are being used to carry weapons, bullets. Um, a lot of gang members are using them as um, debts for other gangs, drugs, rape. A lot of women are being involved. The murder of the innocent girl shocked everyone. Witnesses could point the finger of guilt, but no one would talk. It didn't take too long to identify the culprits. Yeah. Um, they must have had an idea who was. Uh, they would have had a very this. fair idea around the word on the street. It was such a outrageous murder, you know, of girls, innocent girls, that people who wouldn't maybe talk to the police wouldn't go to the police, but would find a channel to let the police know. You know, as a journalist, people were telling me mm. who was there, and within about you know 48 hours, people like myself had a fair idea who the killers were. But of course, the problem for the police was, well, how do we prove it? Where's the evidence? The inquiry into the New Year's Day party shootings would be one of the biggest the West Midlands police ever launched. They had to penetrate a wall of silence. Witnesses were just too scared to come forward. It would take some extraordinary courage from some extraordinary individuals to bring it down. The case of the Brummagens was much easier to handle. Having fled the scene of the botched attack, the gang stopped off here at what was known as the George and the Dragon, only to be apprehended by Sergeant Dawson. He held the entire group at gunpoint until the flying squad arrived. 26 of the 28 stood trial at Guildford Assizes, but they were so boisterous they had to be shackled uh, wrist and ankle, and to each other as well, because they were issuing threats to everybody in the cult. Um, anyway, 23 of the, uh, the gang were convicted. And did they reward Dawson? They did. The commissioner um, uh, highly commended uh, Sergeant Dawson and also uh, rewarded uh, Sergeant Dawson with a sum of five pounds. Um, which when you consider that a police constable's wages uh, at that time was about four quid a week, a fiver was well worth having. Not too bad. The Brummagems all received sentences between nine months hard labor and three years imprisonment. But they would soon be back to their old tricks and racetrack violence would reach such a pitch that the authorities had no choice but to drive the gangs out of horse racing for good. The New Year's Day murders of 2003 cast a two-year-long shadow of silence across the city. The police knew who the four gang members were, but now they had to find the evidence to convict them. Witnesses were too scared to come forward. You know, there was probably about 100 people here at that party, and yet nobody 
not, not a single person came forward to give a written statement, which shows you know, the, the kind of extent of the distrust here. We've, we've got a major murder, people are shocked, angered, yet they still find it very difficult to actually make that step and go to the police. After tens of thousands of man hours, having collected 1,300 statements and recovered 40 vehicles for forensic analysis, the police managed to find enough evidence to bring the four gang members to court. What happened in the trial? What, what was the atmosphere like in the courtroom? It was a very tense atmosphere and a very intimidating atmosphere. Gang members, particularly from the burger bar, whose members were in the dock, would, would turn up at court and quite blatantly and brazenly intimidate witnesses. I mean, it got to the point where people would shout things out while a witness was giving evidence. And you could see the visible effect on the witness. Yeah. You know, the witness would, would clam up after being spoken to. Yeah. People, in fact, were prepared to be sent down for contempt of court rather than yeah, yeah. rather than talk to uh, you know to, to the jury. Yeah. People were being you know followed as they left the courtroom, including myself. And uh, you were judge. followed. I was followed a couple of times back to my car. I mean, by that stage, I'd, I'd written so so much about the gangs that they were probably aware that you know there's a reporter in there who, who seems to know a lot about us. Um, and it got to the stage where I was you know being escorted back to my car with a police officer. But there was one witness who had the courage to speak out. His name wasn't given, he gave his evidence behind a curtain. His voice was electronically distorted and there was a bit of a, a delay from what he said to be, it being relayed out to the courtroom. I mean, the whole courtroom was cleared, nobody was allowed in there. Uh, the defendants couldn't see who this witness was. Uh, you know, they went to unprecedented lengths to protect this witness. I think there were a lot of the measures they introduced had never been seen in a British court right, before. Right, right. Um, and it, it was on this witness's testimony, really, that the whole case hinged, because he was the only guy who named names, as in he said, I saw him in the car, I saw him in the car, I saw him shoot the gun, and I saw him in the car. Not only did the witness give a detailed description of the killers, he also saw Sims outside on his mobile. But would he be believed? One of the unique things about this witness was he was a gangster himself, and he made no bones about it. He, you know, he told the court, I am a member, or have been a member, of the Johnson crew. I am a criminal. I, you know, he was currently in jail when he was giving evidence, mm. um, which brought up all, all kind of legal problems. You know, the defense were claiming, well, how, how can we believe the words of a gangster? Uh, but the CPS and the, the police, I suppose, were desperate, you know. This was all they had. Yeah. His testimony was strong, you know, albeit it came from the mouth of a convicted gangster. Yeah. Clearly the jury believed him. Mr Justice Goldring convicted Marcus Ellis, Nathan Martin and Michael Gregory of killing Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare. They were jailed for 35 years. Rodrigo Sims was given 27 years. While the Brummagems were away in jail, the Sabinis stayed in control and had many violent fights with other London gangs. But soon the Brummagems were out again, terrorising the racetracks. In 1925, the Home Secretary declared that something had to be done to break the gangs. Under Chief Inspector Frederick Nutty Sharp, the flying squad began to target race meetings. With just 12 officers, the flying squad personnel had to be pretty tough to, to deal with the various gangs. You had people like Fred Sharp, who joined the police in 1911, who was extraordinarily brave because on one occasion, about 40 of some of the worst thugs from the Italian mob all surged onto the racetrack. Uh, and Sharp walked onto the racetrack completely single-handedly and said, clear off and just one of them demurred and collected a right hander from uh, sharp put him on his back and the rest of them fled and that was happening all the time didn't the flying squad have these rather grand armored cars that arrived in as well well these were uh, old tenders which had been purchased from the royal flying corps after the first world war uh, and they were enormous and ungainly and they, they had could... these bedstead they areas. did yes that's why they became known as the bedsteads uh, because of the aerial that could be raised or or lowered 
They were very conspicuous. They were extremely conspicuous. I mean, after the, the first time they made a arrest, all of the underworld knew about them. So they were used more as a preventative exercise where they were expecting trouble. In 1932, the National Bookmakers Protection Association was set up to make pitch allocation fairer and to finally eradicate the intimidation of bookmakers. Only a bookmaker approved by the BPA locally and by the jockey club can have a pitch. And that pitch cannot be sold, it has to be passed on. That cuts out people like Kimber coming in and saying, that's my pitch. The Brummagems were once the greatest gang of their era. But after the Flying Squad clamped down on racetrack gangs, they moved off into more lucrative scams, like nightclubs and casinos. The now aging Brummagems were past their prime and losing their appetite for violence. Billy Kimber, their charismatic leader, took one last shot at the Sabini gang before fleeing to America. Gang violence at racecourses has never returned. In Birmingham, 70 years later, the murder of Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare was so shocking it created a standoff between the city's gangs. So this was else. the tipping point between the two gangs? You could say so. It certainly, it certainly awakened a lot of people in both gangs to think, well, hang on, where is this going? What's this leading to? We're, we're, we're killing innocent, innocent girls. We're, you know, we're exposing ourselves to the whole country, to the whole world. One of the most alarming aspects the case highlighted was the close interrelationships between the victims and the gangsters who had shot them. One of them was Marcus Ellis, who was actually the half-brother of Charlene Ellis. So they were related? They were related. Oh. Um, they were estranged, you could say. They, weren't, you know, they hadn't been brought up together, but they were certainly aware of each other. Uh, in fact, um, Charlene had bumped into Marcus literally three, two or three weeks earlier, after about, after about 10 years, having not seen each other. Right. Uh, and they exchanged phone numbers. But despite this, Marcus Ellis shot his half-sister, Charlene, at point-blank range. Perhaps he was unable to see who she was, or perhaps his loyalty to the gang far outweighed any feelings of love he had for a member of his own family. How can we disentangle young lives from the gangland culture? One way is education. Since the death of her daughter, Marcia visits schools to teach young children that they can choose to walk away from gangs. So what is your approach with the kids? Well, my approach to the kids is basically, I'm here to give you yeah. as much information around violent crime. So once I've given you the information, it's down to you as an individual to make the right choice because you've got the information. OK, we might have all went to the same school, but that doesn't mean that, oh, well, let's all go out and get a Mac 10 machine gun That's and right. start going shooting who we want to. So it's about moving yourself away and, you know, making the right choices in where you actually go. Yeah. So what I do is basically have an education strategy in place to help young women to exit out of gangs, because a lot of people get caught up in the crossfires because it's the mums, the dads or brothers. Who are in just there. once you're in, it's difficult to get out. Very hard, it? because... For the, for the boys and the girls. Both. Yeah. Um, it's like, the thing what's hard is that there's consequences. Once mm. you've joined, obviously, you've seen a lot of things... Of course. ..which can make a lot of people be put behind bars. Yeah, so knowing course. that you can't just walk away and say, OK, I'm going to live a normal life. You're a threat to them. A lot of people who I know have been injured in actually trying to exit out of gangs. And if you look behind us, wow. this is the presentation, what we did today. This is what the pupils have absorbed, because this is how they've responded in what they've heard just from today. So they're very passionate, so you know the message is being put out there. You hit the kids quite hard, don't you? You've got to. It's not a soft message you're putting no. over here. No, it isn't, because it's not a soft society, what we're living in. What age are the kids? Um, the kids today was between years seven, eight and ten, um, but we've gone as low as year six. 
which is primary school. This is secondary. So is the future good? Um, the future's better. With the right support and the right things in place, you can clamp down some of it. You can't do the old lot, but some of it. Since 2005, there's been a fall in the number of murders and firearm offences amongst gangs in Birmingham. The deaths of Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare brought it home to everyone in Britain the problems caused by gang feuds and the danger they pose when this level of violence spills out into everyday life.